Welcome to a new test and teardown video. This time it's a boiler and care. Sign random generator type 1024. I'm sorry the picture is uh, sideways and there's a reason for that. <laughs> oh, this uh, is just a beautiful boiler and care unit. It is uh, able to make sine waves from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz but it can also modulate the sine wave uh, like a random um, frequency modulation and i believe this is used for um, acoustic so there are, you can use this um, to measure all sorts of things in an acoustic room without um, being disturbed by peaks so this is why you need a wider uh, frequency span instead of a single uh, peak frequency when you're doing a, a sweep. There's uh, something wrong with this um, unit. Uh, there's a mechanical problem. Uh, there's a glass is loose. This is quite easy to fix. And there's a, there are some sparks coming out of it. And there is a 700 hertz kind of problem where the where the output glitches as well and i think there's a mechanical thing here with the gearbox that is also not working so uh, that is why it is sideways that is uh, to not cause uh, harm to the needle here so this thing weighs 20.0 kilograms <laughs> that is just fantastic so you can use it to uh, calibrate your scale isn't that amazing? So it's from 1965 to 1968, depending on what kind of version it is. And uh, yeah, it contains of 17 tubes. 17. Uh, I've been googling a little bit around for a manual that says something about its uh, power consumption, and I didn't find all that details yet, but I will see what I can do about that. Oh yeah, um, by the way, the, the fundamental function here is that there are actually two oscillators. Uh, one oscillator is a fixed oscillator of a 123 kilohertz. And then there is a variable. This one is the variable oscillator. And that oscillator goes from 100 to 120 kilohertz. And then those two are mixed. And uh, this is how you get the uh, from almost zero to about 20 kilohertz and here's of course the output from that mix uh written on the scale right yeah this is a little bit annoying so yeah i need to open it first and then have a look so before we open it let's have a look at the rear side we've got three additional outputs uh, on the back and those are only used uh, for calibration and just to check that the instrument is uh, working correctly this is our variable oscillator, the 100 to 120 kilohertz. And then we got a 120 kilohertz and 123. They actually make the 123 by adding three kilohertz to the 120. So that's a little bit funny. So I expect to see this one not super clean, but modulated uh, with both of those uh, frequencies, by the way. Yes, a little bit uh, oldie style uh, mains uh, connector and of course a voltage selector. So yeah, I better open it. Oh, this is the first view inside. At uh, the first glance, it's not looking that bad, but I do see some corrosion and some stuff that is not super nice. This looks like... Um, a basement storage for quite some years when you see those uh, rusted parts but this those are actually made of some uh, type of uh, metal that really corrodes super super easy so so if you have this don't be super alarmed it is quite normal you can also see it here this is also super easy to uh, to corrode and uh, it's also very normal to see the tube sockets, uh, this brown here on the 
PCB material. And in the good old days, uh, printed circuit boards uh, material wasn't really that well for very high temperatures for many, many years. Also think about this one is from the middle of the 1960s. So it's probably been running a year, quite a lot of hours. So of course it is uh, okay to see uh, this. What I heard about some sparks up here, or was it up here? I can't remember exactly uh, where it was supposed to be, but that is definitely something I need to uh, to check. Uh, how we uh, open this thing is uh, we take away the four screws here, and then we pull out the entire thing out the front. So that is a classic thing with old tube equipment. Before I pull this out, there's actually really, really a cool thing that you need to see. Look at this shaft that goes all the way through the unit. And on both sides, there is a an access point here. And this is actually a mechanical uh, remote control interface. So in the old days, instead of having a an IEEE cable, it was a mechanical interface for remote um, sweeping uh, gearboxes, motors, and all that kind of stuff. So it was sweeping uh, other kind of uh, measuring uh, equipment as well. And in parallel also sweeped uh, the generator like an R2-D2 uh, mechanical interface. I think that is super, super cool and uh, quite normal for, for the time. And here there is a, as you can hear, the mechanical interface actually works, but that wheel down there moves but it is not affecting here. So there's, uh, it's kind of decoupled at the moment and I don't know how to engage it. Uh, there's probably an electrical clutch or something like that, that in here. So maybe if we power it up and enable the remote control, probably that will uh, enable the clutch because it looks a little bit like it here, right? So let's have a little look inside this big and wonderful unit. And the first thing, I see because I want to access the meter really that is what I want to do first because it's super fragile and I don't want to uh, break the, the needle here so I want to take out the, the meter but I see that we have a missing bulb so there's supposed to be a light in the meter of course and there's also a missing bulb down there and there's supposed to be light in the big round frequency indicator here as well so that is a little bit strange here in the middle we got the power supply so this is a classic thing with a, a voltage reference tube a pentode that measures the output voltage and regulate the output voltage and here is actually also a power pentode uh, but that one is uh, cobbled as a cathode follower so that's just all that is doing and this uh, pentode controls that one so that should be fairly easy uh, to get up and running. Uh, the rest of the stuff I'm inspecting, I don't really see any leaks or burns or anything that prevents me from uh, from powering up this, uh, this unit. Uh, I think I wanna go and clean it up a little bit outside first. Some compressed air and a soft, soft brush. And then I should be able to uh, to clean it up a little bit. We can also um, see the very large size coils. And that's of course because this one goes to very low uh, frequencies. We've got the different oscillators and mixers and stuff like that. Also uses inductors here. And uh, oh yeah, before I was talking about the, the clutch unit here. This is indeed an electrically um, enabled uh, clutch so that is definitely why there is no connection at the moment. It is supposed to be like that. So that is uh, perfectly fine. Uh, it is also explained in the schematic. That will be the output uh, transformers. And they're really, really big again, because we're going very low frequency. So yeah, what else can I say? There's not a lot uh, more to say, really. We've got some uh, filter units down here. And those are very, very big, again, because it's uh, low frequency. So I managed to get the, the meter front out, and it's actually still in the process of uh, 
glue drying. What I am using is a clear uh, contact glue. I'm sorry this is written in Danish, but anyway, it's just a clear contact glue. And that is super easy to clean off. And it's you don't need to be insanely strict or super good with cleaning because, of course, it's transparent. So there's not this little orange yellow uh, miscoloring at the sides and you will be able to see that if you're using regular contact glue so this is why i really prefer to use the transparent one so that is a nice trick if you see the screws here or of course the the threads they um i was i, I tried to get the whole meter out by removing uh the nuts let me see if i can get a nice picture of that from the inside see here on the inside you see those bolts with threads so by removing those i had the idea i could push out the entire meter but that is completely stuck and i think it's because of this rubber gasket here uh, maybe they added glue or something like that or it's just uh after those 60 years, it just sticks so well to the paint, it's just impossible to push out the meter. So I just leave the meter in. But what I did is I figured out that those holes they made in the aluminium plate, that is so you can access the screws. If you take out all four screws from the inside, you can just take out the entire front here and service the meter isn't that a nice solution and by removing the 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 nuts and the stuff here right then i actually got as you can see it's covering half of the hole that gave me the access to the screws so that was a neat little trick if you want to perform service on a unit like this also, if you see the front now, while I was waiting for the glue to dry, I deep, deep cleaned the front. So we had some stickers and leftover tape. I don't know if you're able to see anything like that here. Look how, how nice and clean the unit is now. It is looking like brand new. I still have a little bit of a challenge to get the dirt out under that knob. Oh, by the way, I really like the the way that, that this is made with some wires and <laughs> pulleys and stuff to, to make this sound. Oh, that is so cute. Yeah, but now it's really nice and beautiful and I think I will assemble it tomorrow and uh, try and power it up and play with the electrical stuff but i just really needed to fix the meter first because don't want to break the the needle oh yeah about the meter i also had some problems with the end stoppers here so this little piece of soft material that is here it was bent down by the glass so the glass was definitely broken for many years and just stuck in some old glue or something like that when i picked up the instrument i didn't feel the glass loose so i had it was uh, maybe a, a transport damage uh, from my uh, from my cart uh, transport but i think it was definitely loose for many years because it went down and bent those little thingies here and when they were bent of course when the needle goes all the way here it goes stuck under this little thing so it needs to be right up like this. So I was able to fix that little detail as well. So now we're not going to have a stock meter anymore. And uh, I had some dirt here. I don't know if you can see it. I don't want to wash away all the dirt because I'm super afraid that I might as well also wash away the lines here. I don't want to damage that. But I washed enough of the dirt away so from a little distance you don't see this anymore anyway. I just wanted to show you a little detail here about the Bakelite. So the meter here is made of a uh, Bakelite. See, I've put in the glass now. So down here, I've just wiped it a little bit and I didn't polish it. But here in the top, look at that. See, here's it is polished. Oh, let me see if I can show you. Nice and shiny again. So that is a little 
Nice, nice detail. In case you wonder how to change the bulb in the frequency dial here. So to access this, it seems like it's impossible to access, it, access this uh, bulb from the bottom or from the back side because of the way that it is it's looking like that, right? So you need to pull this entire socket uh, part and it's mounted with little springs and all that kind of stuff. This bulb here is super easy to access from the back side and that is the only way to access um, that one. So of, also, of course it is a different type of bulb. So the, the idea is actually, all you have to do is of course remove the two knobs. That's uh, real easy. And then pull out this. And there was a little, tiny little groove here at the bottom that actually revealed how this is done. And if you look real careful from the inside, you can probably see those black plastic things that sticks in. And they are not completely symmetric, as you can see here, right? And uh, of course, if you use the right kind of tools, you can do this without causing scratches to the plastic. It is very difficult to do. And I was super, super careful. I think I actually, probably they were there before. But it is very, very difficult because the way that this is shaped, so you need to get all the way down here and then pull real careful. But now I can clean this from the bottom as well or from the back side, as you can see here. So this is going to be nice and clear again. And then also this I want to clean up. So soon I will be able to power this up. I think it's really cute, this little springy system here. So it's sitting like that. Oh yeah, by the way, this uh, the measurements for those uh, bolts here is just absolutely not standard. So I just soldered a little piece of metal at each end here. And now it's, it's fitting. I'm putting in a 12 volt um, two watt bulb here. So it's not uh, glowing way too uh, powerful. And the other one here is a uh, 6.3 volts, um, 300 milliamps. So that's actually two watts. So I'm a little bit worried this is too bright. And that is why I wait to put on the glass here to see how that looks. I heard something about sparks and stuff that should be the problem with this uh, unit. So now I'm actually powering it up using a Vario. And I'm gonna do it real slowly. And hopefully we're gonna see where it is because I've been inspecting everything and I cannot see any kind of sparky uh, problems or anything like that. So. Um, Let's just uh, crank everything on. Uh, why is that not happening? If I turn on the unit. Can I get light in my bulb? So it's 80 volts. Hundred and sixty two hundred and twenty six volts. I can even hear the tone. Yes, there is a sparky, sparky sound. Where the heck did that come from? Did you hear it? Ooh, scary. <laughs> okay, I found the sparky place. Check on the left side of the blue capacitor. Now this blue capacitor is in the middle of the picture. Okay, to the left of that one, right? You'll see a, uh, a little resistor that is almost touching it. There's only a little bit of distance right here right so let's try and move the output frequency to a very special frequency see 
Ooh, it sparks over here. So that is something we need to fix. I am still fighting with the arc over problem in the output section. And uh, I actually get some arc over between some of those tracks, and especially those two tracks here, and it's like random places. And of course the, the tracks are, as you can see, very, very close, located, even that close to ground screws as well. I mean, I would expect a little bit more from uh, Brut and Care. Um, so they're probably more or less very, very close to arcing over all of them and not just uh, this unit. So I added a little bit of uh, my green PCB uh, repair um, varnish. See, it's also a completely non-coated PCB. And uh, so I'm still uh, looking for a reason for this. And I believe the output amplifier is probably running way too high gain somewhere. And uh, so that is uh, something I need to track down as well. And um, meanwhile, I'm going around and uh, searching for all sorts of cool things uh, that I can, I can do something about. And uh, I believe down here is the amplifier. And down here is the fixed oscillator. This is the 123 oscillator. It's uh, actually mixed together with a three kilohertz oscillator. And uh, if you look at that capacitor down there, this one can't be good. This uh, white puke, and this is C10. But I, but I don't, don't think that should have an effect on the problem that we see here, because that is just an, a local decoupling for the anode circuit. Uh, for one of the tubes, so that was a C10. So there's also a, I think this one is C17, and that is the decoupling for the other N out. But I think I will, uh, I will change those uh, when I'm in there anyway, because it's a little bit difficult to to go in there and poke around with that. So better go and uh, fix some of those uh, good old capacitors while I am at it. So I was able to change those two capacitors. That was. Uh, not that difficult. Oh, that is difficult to take a focus. And uh, I had to remove the bottom shield. So there was a bottom shield plate here. Super easy with some screws and some screws on the sides. Easy, easy. And then we can access uh, this board. And I think it's quite funny with this little board that consists of the uh, oscillator and mixer, the 123 kilohertz, and then V14. I mean, if you look at the schematic V1 and 14, they're just far away on the schematic, and it only makes sense when you look at the front panel. So here is the compressor settings, and that tube is the compressor tube. So it's just because it's convenient to have that, you know, the knob, the switch, that tube that handles all this, and then the oscillator and this um, transformer uh, thing here. And then it's, you'll see this, the oscillator tube is connected to this big, uh, resonator uh, inductor stuff and also of course for the for the fixed 120 is here so of course they want to put them in the bottom of the unit where the temperature is most constant and not that much heated from uh, tubes and stuff if you put all this at the top of the unit where all the heat is collected that will of course give you the worst performance. You also want to have big heavy things uh, closest to the bottom to give uh, your unit a good, good, you know, stable. So yeah, I don't think those two capacitors uh, is uh, direct or indirectly uh, connected to my main problem. Uh, I just saw some bad capacitors and of course I changed them. That is uh, all there is uh, to it really. So when I'm um, doing service on stuff like this, 
Yeah, you can see how bad that really is. I often uh, mark all my capacitors with the original position. So, and then I just save all these capacitors for later so I can perform some sort of uh, wisdom on them. So, <laughs> that is a little trick for you if you want to, uh, yeah, I don't know. You know what I mean. So, we are now on the other side of the unit. And this is uh, V4 and V5. They're hidden in here. And as you see here, we don't have any electrolytics that I need to poke around with uh, on that board. And uh, V4 is the variable oscillator. Uh, so that goes uh, from 100 to 120. And V5 is the mixer. And uh, here we got C2 and C3, 100 microfarad. Funny, they isolated um, the case away from chassis. And then they have a wire from this capacitor's chassis directly down to the board's uh, ground here. I think that is to uh, minimize sensitive currents in the, in the chassis. You don't want that, actually. Uh, also because this is the oscillator right and that will be um, a local decoupling to the two uh, anode circuits of uh, v4 so that is definitely important that that one is uh, working and it's of course 100 microfarad because this thing goes all the way to 20 hertz so you need a, a real big one here so i will definitely have to inspect the voltages here and hopefully i don't see any ripple or anything bad stuff here Otherwise, I have to replace that one. <laughs> I got a major, major breakthrough. See, here is V6, and that is the input grid. This one is connected to the pot meter, to the output level pot meter. But there is no resistor to ground. So that means when that pot meter is not working, it's full on noisy, noisy, crappity crap, right? So that means this uh, grid goes uh, floating, noisy, pickups, all sorts of stuff, right? And that uh, actually uh, give pulses of high frequencies at full smash into V6. That goes straight to V7, our output um, driver tube, right? And remember, there's a very, very big inductor L3 connected to 300 volts or 360 volts, right? So that very, very big inductor directly to the anode here, and that tube gets supercharged with high frequency pulses. That means it will just generate thousands of volts uh, out of that um, activated uh, inductor. And that's of course uh, sparking all over the place. Uh, because of that. So it's of course a little bit stupid design. So what I did here is I added a 330k resistor uh, on that input and uh, that is of course okay because the pot meter is a 30k pot meter. It sits down here. This is the output level pot meter and it's completely dead. It is a linear uh, so it should be quite easy to uh, to change. It is a little bit difficult to get in there, but I figured I could get access to those screws down there. And there's another one, yeah, there. And then I could probably figure that out here on the front. We can see that the pot meter is quite corroded and you can even hear it's just completely wasted. Uh, so also I figured out the the oscillator here was very low and the mixer output was very, very low as well. And uh, so I took the two um, ECC81s here and took them to my tube tester and yeah, they're absolutely dead as well. It was like uh, under half, way under half of the, the gain left in those two, um, two tubes. So they don't uh, work anymore. And they have been changed because see, you can see they're different brands. They wouldn't, this can't be the original. 
So yeah, you need to be an acrobat, by the way, to get in here and change the tubes and get those shields off and I don't know what. But that was a lot of fun. Now I got plenty of output. It's nice and stable. I actually found two tubes from my collection with like more than <laughs> more than specified gains. So uh, that was uh, super good. Well, that was super super easy. What kind of luck is that? And by the way. See, there's a yellow marking here on one of the coax cables, and that one goes to the sensor tab. So that is, of course, the output, and the input is not marked. So that is uh, all I need to remember, and then I'll be able to figure out how to get a new pot in here. So I think this is the last problem to solve, and I just did it. So here's a brand new modern style 30k oh, damn it it is difficult to get this to focus come on man see and um this type of uh hot meters they got uh, i don't know quite a lot of wipers right and uh, so i expect this one to be super duper uh, stable um the thing is this is a six millimeter and this is a 6.3 so it's a quarter inch uh, shaft and you can even see that it is a little bit thicker but what kind of luck is that the the, the knob is actually designed to be very loosey juicy here right and the design of the knob actually allows a lot of play here so what we can do we can actually stick it on and it's just going to go a little bit See, a little bit tidy tidy, but I will be able to push it in. I will do that when I found the right. Oopie doopie doop. I don't know if I can show you guys this at the same time, but so here's the nice smooth uh, upward level. And uh, of course, I can dial the frequency dial here. Ooh, fantastic. And uh, this unit got some really, really funny features about how to um, to make uh, white band random noise. Oh, maybe I should get a speaker on or something like that. But don't you just think it looks beautiful with the light here? If you are down here, it's of course a little bit annoying. I I put a serious diode and. <laughs> with that bulb so now it's uh, a lot more dim I even used a 300 uh, 6.5 volt a uh, 300 milliamp um, bulb and the manual is half an amp are you crazy man that will be way too bright and then I gave it a diode so now it's even half that so and the top one here is a 12 volt um, 200 milliamps I think so that is really nice and dim. I mean, in the in the night, if we if we do it like that, it's gonna be nice. So I've added a tiny little amplifier and a little speaker here, so you can hear what is going on. I am taking out the signal here from the the load. I put in a 600 ohm resistor, and I'm using the 6000 ohm tapping. So that is the full tapping of the output transformer. And uh, in, in this mode, it is of course not responding to the output attenuator. Uh, and that is the, that output. And the, in that output mode, it gives way too low output. So it's not really interesting. And now with my new uh, nice and fine uh, output level here, we are now in sine wave. Let's crank on the, the power supply and then see how long it takes for it to uh, warm up. I've added a little bit of I don't hear anything. It takes a little while. Yeah, here we go. Okay, I cranked down the the volume here as well. So that is uh, nice sine wave, right? 
and um, let's try and uh, play with the bandwidth selector. So that is the that is a lot of uh, fun. Uh, let's crank up the. So now it goes down in volume because it wants to fit the modulation. So this is ten hertz, thirty, one hundred. So it goes. 300 and then the full span is of course noise it sounds exactly like noise you shouldn't be able to hear anything on the frequency dial right but if we go back to 300 hertz with you can of course hear something here right so if we go for 30 hertz of uh, of random so here's the frequency alignment Ooh, you can make all sorts of scary, scary. Let's go down. I think if you adjust this right, you can probably make some of these uh, <laughs> really funny effects. I don't know. I kind of like it. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. 10 hertz. It sounds like something is <laughs> is wrong but it's of course supposed to do this all right thank you very much for watching bye bye